Now, can I also say, just in passing, uh, we're looking in the Word of God this evening to the book of Exodus. So while you're looking that up, let me mention that there are some tapes I've mentioned to many of you, but some maybe haven't. The Menace of Freemasonry, uh, lectures on the subject of Freemasonry and exposing the awful dangers that accompany not only those who are themselves Freemasons, but the problems that goes down the ancestral line, often to third, fourth generation, where people can be spiritually bound and can also have uh, physical uh, symptoms of illness, can have uh, a number of problems prone to accidents and so forth. Uh, a curse, the curse of Freemasonry, uh, comes down the family line. And it's a subject that needs to be uh, debated, it needs to be taught, it needs to be uh, talked about among Christians, because sometimes Christians uh, are held by bonds that they don't understand, and the root can on many occasions be related to Freemasonry. So we encourage you, if you want one of those, you can see Paul. And also uh, the Lewis Revival by Dr. Colin Peckham, the 1949 Lewis Revival. I remember uh, as a young Christian, when God first started to deal with my life as a Christian, I got a tape, an ordinary cassette tape. I didn't have DVDs or anything in those days. And I re remember listening to that tape. And it had such a profound effect on me uh, in listening to the tape. And you know, it's amazing what God uses to draw you toward himself. It is absolutely amazing. And God can use things at a period in your life, and in all probability, he never use them again. I could watch that, those tapes and listen to them now. They would never have the same impact on me now that they did then, because God had them arranged at that time, and it stirred in my heart a desire to seek the Lord. And so the Lord is good. And if you, uh, we would encourage you to listen to that story of the awakening as to how God worked uh, back in 19... 43 in Lewis. Now, we're going to turn in the Word of God this evening to the book of Exodus, and we're turning to chapter 2. And while you have that turn, now I've got you to the book and now I've got you to the chapter. I'm going to read you a little bit from David and Rachel Burke. Uh, many of us know David and Rachel, where they work out in, uh, <coughs> with the Baga people. And uh, I just want to read a few lines here. There's also a number of of prayer letters, and we would encourage you to take one uh, with you and keep up to date with David and Rachel and little Daniel and Rebecca, their little children, because they're in very primitive conditions out there. But uh, we, we pray that you will remember them as well in their labors. Now, they have told us here, in our last up update, we requested prayer for David's mum, who suffered a major stroke in November. David did go home for eight days at the end of November and found her very weak. Her stroke symptoms were improving, but she had a bowel problem, uh, a bowel problem which was leaving her weak. Um, she had to almost give up eating. It says, and all in all, she is taking, uh, talking very well and very bright on it. They are present, uh, presenting presently, I beg your pardon, doing physio, which is helping her greatly. We have had many uh, been encouraged by the concern and prayers of many of God's people. Last month, we had our field conference here with the president of NTM's Bible schools in the States as the speaker. The children enjoyed the uh, childcare program which was provided. Now, we want to encourage you to take these for sake of time and to read them and pray for David and Rachel. I think there's a, there's a number of them, isn't there, at that just at that door, so we encourage you to do that, please. I think that's all the announcements now. Let's turn uh, to the Word of God, to the book of Exodus, and we're going to read from chapter 2, and we're going to read verse 1. And there went a man of the, of the house of Levi and took a wife of the daughter of Levi and conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months, and when she could not longer hide him, she took him, uh, she took for him an ark of bulrushes, daubed it with slime and with pitch, and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. 
And the daughter of Pharaoh came to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the river's side, and when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent to, to meet the, her maid to fetch it. When she had opened, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him, and said, This is one of the Hebrew children. Then verse 9, Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. That was Moses, his own mother. And the child grew, and she brought, that's his own natural mother, she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, and she said, Because I drew him out of the water. It came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens, and he spied an Egyptian smiting an Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way, and when he saw there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together, and, said to, and he said to them that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee a judge, a prince or a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. When Pharaoh heard this, now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses <coughs> fled from the face of Pharaoh, and from and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Turn over with me now, please, to chapter three. We're cutting the story to an extent for the sake of time. Chapter three. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Moses said, I will now turn aside, see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. He said, Draw not nigh thither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abram, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face, and he was afraid to look upon God. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them out of the land unto a land with a large, unto a good land and a large, and a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore. I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I, that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly, I will be with thee. And this shall be a token to thee, that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. Amen, and God will bless the public reading of his word. Let's unite in prayer. Our Father, we come before thee, and we thank you, Lord, for your holy word. And we thank you, Father, for the record of thy dealings in the lives of individuals many thousand years ago. And we thank thee, Lord, while thou art unique in thy dealings with men. Yet, O God, thou dost come thyself still to men. Thou dost put thy hand on them and women. Thou dost call them, Lord. Thou dost put thy seal on their lives. We pray, O God, tonight, that thou would bless the truth of thy word to every heart. And we pray that thou would help us, Lord, in some measure to grasp the greatness of thee, that we might fear thee, Lord, and that we might walk before thee. O God, help us. These things we ask in Jesus' name. To this end, I take the promised Holy Ghost, the blessed power of Pentecost, to fill me to the uttermost, I take. And I thank you, Lord, that he, the Holy Spirit, will undertake. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. As a little boy, I belonged to a Presbyterian church, 
And anybody who was brought up Presbyterian will remember that there's a blue, not unlike this one here before us, there's always a blue piece of lovely, usually velvet, comes down from the pulpit. And then in the center, there's that picture or image of a burning bush. And I was always inquisitive as a little boy looking at this bush because, unfortunately, the minister wasn't always very um, captivating. And so I found myself uh, looking at the arrangements of the windows and various things in the church. But my eye often sat on this bush and often wondered what it meant and what was the significance of it. But when we look together in the Word of God in Exodus, perhaps the person who most would understand and would best be able to explain the significance of the burning bush would be Moses himself, the man who met the Lord at the bush. There's some very interesting things about this burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. The first thing is that prior to the bush coming alight, Moses was in the wilderness now for 40 years. Again, for you and I, it is difficult. And I think when we're young, and even those of us who are older in the faith, one of the most difficult things to learn in life is patience. And here was a man who was perhaps in his own mind spending the best years of his life wandering about as a shepherd. Now, sometimes I have said, in, in, uh, both in preaching and also in, just in conversation, that perhaps he had lost all vision of God. But in my study of the scriptures, I was able to discern that I had said wrongly. Because the scriptures make it clear in the book of Hebrews that this man was aware, even during this period of 40 years of probation, where he was just looking after sheep, where he got married and had two sons. During this period of probation, God was still dealing with Moses. And Moses had something in his heart. And if you had got to Moses and talked to him in a really deep conversation, you would have discovered that when Moses would have taken off the layers of his activities, his marriage, his children, and you'd have got to the core of Moses' being, you would have discovered that this man knew that God had something for him. You see, God had put something in his heart, something that only the Holy Spirit can implant in a man. It is something that can never be attained psychologically. It can't be attained or maintained by human resources. It is something that is divine. And God had implanted something in this boy's heart. Whether it came at some stage during his mother's conversations to him, as she nursed him, and reminded him of his Jewish roots that God implanted, but somewhere along the line, God put his hand into Moses' heart. And God put something there that could not be extinguished. And so Moses, the Bible says, endured, as we mentioned last week, he endured seeing him who is invisible. Now, that word endured is very interesting because it means that he bided his time. Moses was not unlike Saul. He did as occasion served. God was with him. And there are times when God leads us clearly in our lives. And then it seems that we don't seem to have the certainty or the clarity of God's guidance. It is then that God expects us to do as occasion serves, to serve him as we can, where we can, to seek by his grace to walk with him and to walk in his light. And Moses was doing that for a full 40 years, biding his time. That's commendable, 40 years of biding time. But I want you to notice about this chapter 3 that Moses, no doubt, I have no doubt in his heart that it was merely another day of looking after the sheep. It was just another day of going about his business. But nevertheless, there was something, I believe it was God ultimately overruling in his life, that he did not merely go to the backside of the desert and led the flock, but also he went to the place, the mountain of God, even Horeb. 
Something was drawing him and there was always a divine pull on this man. And you know, in every Christian, when we come to the Lord and the Holy Spirit comes in, there is always a divine pull on our lives. Even when a person feels the Lord or backslides from the Lord, if they're genuinely converted, there is always a divine pull. God is always uh, drawing us. He is always using chastening or whatever under him is the wisest and the best means of getting us back on path again. The Lord will do that. There's a divine draw. And you know, one of the things that I appreciate more over the years is the fact that when I feel the Lord or when I step out of line, that the Lord in his mercy speaks to me. That the Lord in his mercy rebukes me. That he tells me that I've done wrong. He tells me that I've failed him and I become aware of it. And he draws me back to the cross and back to repentance. That I might get up and go on in fellowship with him. You see, the Lord had drawn this man. But there was something unique about this appearance uh, of the fire burning. Now, again, as many of you probably know, there was nothing unique about a bush burning. Bushes just just exploded. That was a natural thing. They just went on fire in the desert. The heat of the sun, they would just suddenly, either spark or the light would reflecting would cause them to go on fire. That wasn't unique. The uniqueness of it was that the fire burned, but it was not consumed. The fire wasn't burning up the bush. That was the uniqueness. And so this man comes along. Now you see, did this just merely happen? Was this just an unusual event or was it pre-planned by the Lord? Does God just merely happen to see us in a position and break in? Or does the God of heaven plan things in our lives? Well, the answer, not only from here, but throughout Scripture, is that God plans things. God has plans in our lives. And along the journey, he sometimes permits us to see them clearly. Sometimes clearly to see them. And I remember on one occasion, I may have said before, but I remember on one occasion going up, uh, David McGarry, many of you know David, said to me uh, many years ago, would you go to the island of Lewis? Because I always had an interest, you see, in the subject of revival and, of course, Lewis and so on. And so I jumped at the idea. I was uh, at home just recovering from a bad phase of depression. And David also had gone through a bad patch in his life. So the two musketeers took off and drove up to the islands for the first time. And I remember arriving and we traveled around these beautiful islands, met folk, and a former student in the college whom we had knew took us from one place to another. And we went along to um, where my wife Rachel lives and we went, she had been a student as well, so we were meeting former students that lived in the island. And uh, that night we went, there was a meeting on in the local little hall in a place called Gross Bay. That hall's no longer in use, it's in disarray now. But I remember going into that little hall that um, Tuesday or Wednesday night, rather, and going into the meeting, and of course I'd never dreamed, but they were talking in Gaelic. I just assumed that they would speak in English, but they were speaking in Gaelic. And I knew very quickly that it wasn't going to be a very impressive meeting for me. So I took down my Bible and I was able to understand that when he read from Genesis and the chapter, I understood that. And then as he read the chapter, he would read occasionally about Jacob. And I knew Jacob was Jacob, uh, but that was all I knew. So I decided I would read the chapter, but I would not necessarily get anything from a sermon. And you know, you can go into meetings like that and you have it all sussed out that it's going to be a chore and a bore. And then when we get out, we'll be fine. But in that meeting, God spoke to me. In that meeting, God spoke to me as a man preached in Gaelic. And from the text that he read, I read the text also. And the verse was, I will bring thee again into this land. And I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And I never passed a remark, but I remember marking it in my Bible. And uh, I went home. And on the way home, I was speaking to David. And he said to me, would you ever go back? I said, yes, I'll be back. 
How do you know you'll be back? I said, the Lord told me in that meeting I'd be back. Now, I didn't know the next time I'd be back would be to get married. But the Lord knew. Did the Lord plan? Of course the Lord planned. The Lord was planning. And you see, sometimes in our lives, God permits us to see things. We're able to look back and say, the Lord had his hand on that. David didn't just happen to come to me and say, do you want to go? The Lord planned that. You see, and that's the lovely thing about leaving our lives open to the Lord. The Lord brings people along and does things, says things, and we don't realize, but God is planning it all. He's working in our lives. And so the Lord had planned. Now, the, the, the thing about Moses is very similar to ourselves, is that Moses, no doubt, like ourselves, was a pretty selfish person. You see, Moses was absorbed in himself. Because Moses said to the Lord, when the Lord called him, he said, what am I that I should go? And he raised all these complaints that he couldn't speak right. And, and you see, Moses was thinking about, you know, how will I feel? What about me? That's the most natural thing to all of us, no matter how sanctified we are. There's always this proneness to self. How is this going to affect me? How, how, what am I going to get out of it? Or what, how, how will I respond? So forth and so on. The Lord had planned this not only for the good of Moses, but for the good of others. Now, that's important. What the Lord was doing and what he had planned in the burning of the bush was not merely for Moses. What God does supernaturally in your life and mine is not merely for yourself. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1 and verse 6. Joseph died and all his brethren and all, the, all that generation. The children of Israel were fruitful, multiplied and, and exceeding uh, mightily. Verse 8. There arose a new king over Egypt which knew not Joseph. And he said unto the people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and it come to pass that when falleth out any war, they will join against our enemies, fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. Therefore did they set over them taskmasters to afflict them uh, with their burdens, and they built for, for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were more grieved because of the children of Israel. I want you to notice that at this period, after the death of Joseph, there were changes that were taking place in the nation. Now, many of us who are older can look back to a time 20, 30 years ago, some of you far longer, and you remember what the nation was like. You can remember what the church was like. And in a generation, things have changed. Things always change. The Bible says, the, uh, to, to, to encapsulate, it says there arose a king over Egypt that knew not Joseph. In other words, the people of God were no longer in favor. So there were changes. Now I want you to see that this is all relevant to the burning of the bush in the desert. Verse 11 uh, to 14, let's see what it says. Verse 14, we've read up to 13. The Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. They made their lives bitter with hard bondage in uh, mortar, brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. There were changes and there was cruelty. You see, the church... The, the people of God were coming under the cruelty of the new king. And that's what always happens as, as wickedness comes to the fore. There's cruelty unleashed. You only have to new, look at newspapers today to, to recognize the cruelty, the manifestation of sin and wickedness and devilment. But then there are cries. Look at chapter 2 that we looked at together and verse 23. Chapter 2 and verse 23. It came to pass in the process that the king of Egypt died. The children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of their bondage, and the Lord heard their groaning and remembered the covenant with Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. 
So this burning bush comes at a planned moment. In the life of a man who's now 80 years of age, it comes not merely for him. It's not just for him to go out and tell, I've seen a burning bush, I've met the Lord. It comes because of changes that have happened in previous generations. It comes because of immense cruelty against the people of God, and it comes because a cry has arisen from their hearts that has caused the God of heaven to intervene supernaturally in the life of this unique being called Moses. You see, we must understand that God is never working in the short term. That's why we must never despair, because the church is going through a prolonged period of dryness. We should never measure that God has disappeared or lost his power because we go through a continual period of dearth. God has not changed, has not changed. He's exactly the same. You see, perhaps we'll look at some stage at Habakkuk, but I've been studying the little book of Habakkuk. He was a man who had immense problems. He really, he really got tied up in nuts in his own soul because he wondered why God wasn't intervening for his prayers. And God had to come and speak to him and let him see things that previously he would never have thought of. God's always working long term. And when we grasp the glory and the significance and the wonder of that, it helps us to have peace as believers, to realize despite that things are bad, that the Lord is still over all and that we are his children. It was planned. Now, there's one thing in passing I read this evening. I wasn't particularly preparing, but I read it and it touched me. I was reading about the Nation of Israel, a magazine that I get every month, and it said this, talking about the history of the Jews. It said that content nations have no history. That's interesting. Content nations. What do you mean content nations have no history? I mean nations that were never in conflict or war, there's no history about them. There's no records about them. The only records in history that go back are history of nations that fought. And brothers and sisters, if Israel had not fought, there would have been no history. Israel has fought from her inception. And can I progress it further than to say to you and I as individuals, where there is no conflict in our lives with spiritual powers to advance, then there is no history. If we do not uh, go on as, as Timothy was exhorted, endure hardness as good soldiers, we will have no story. Think of Moses with the, the, the story that he has left behind. Go back a few generations and think of the multi-million and billionaires unknown forgotten. Their lives were full of lust, but they had no conflicts with the powers of darkness. They had no history. The memory of the just is blessed. All right, this bush, this was a planned thing. Not only was it planned, but in Moses' eye, it was totally unexpected. God comes unexpectedly. The God whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. When they were all in the upper room awaiting, suddenly there was a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. You see, God often breaks into the lives of those who he'll use unexpectedly. I don't know what this man expected. I know that something was burning in his heart in that God had something for him. But to suggest that, that it would come in the form of a burning bush as he was looking after sheep, I believe he never would have anticipated that. And brothers and sisters, it's amazing how God can so supernaturally break into our lives. 
The late Duncan Campbell stated in testimony that prior to the awakening and God uh, coming upon him, that he was really having quite a mediocre ministry. That in fact he was had to confess and repent of pride because he was looking for positions to take in relation to speaking at conferences. And he was very full of himself because he was getting invitations to various conferences and so forth. And yet God took him aside in his room and God dealt with him there supernaturally in the stillness. You find the same thing occurred in the life of Douglas Brown, the minister who had a great ministry in England, very well spoken and very, very gentle preacher. Douglas Brown was to be used in, in East Anglia and down the East Coast and assisted and, and, and uh, was used by the Lord along with that other great preacher uh, in Scotland. His name evades me now, but not to worry. And the two of them, the two of them would have met up and this English man was called down and prior to the calling to preach the word of God, he was taken from his pulpit into the back and there God dealt with him all night, all night. These supernatural meetings with God. You find it with Gideon. Do you remember Gideon whenever he was threshing and he was just getting enough for his family? And then the Lord appears. Just out of the blue, the Lord appears. Do you remember Elisha when he's plowing? He's a farmer. And all of a sudden Elijah appears. And God's calling him. There is always the air of the supernatural. I fear, as I've often said before, when I listen to people relating about the call of God in their lives, and there is a lack of the supernatural. I always fear that. Because there is always, when God calls a man or woman, there is always the inexplicable undercurrent of the supernatural. Always. Always. There's a large aspect of it that is totally inexplicable. It was unexpected, the burning bush. The burning bush was attractive. Attractive. He saw this bush and the Bible says, I will now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush is not burned. Curiosity. God puts out a fishing hook and he puts it in something that interests us and he starts pulling. And all of a sudden we become absorbed in this particular thing, whatever it is. In my case, it happened to be the Lewis Awakening. That's what it happened to be. It could have been anything else, but in my case, my burning bush was the story of the Lewis Awakening. When God started to do something, started to create something, started to fan something inside. He said, I'm going to turn aside. You see, God often draws us toward him by creating a curiosity. In something about himself. I challenge you to look back over your life as a Christian and think of the times when God drew you toward him. There was some form of curiosity was created in your mind that caused you to go after the Lord. It may have been something different for us all. But the Lord done it. And it was attractive. You know, friends, when the Lord calls and when the Lord is drawing us for a specific or a particular job in our lives to be done, there is a unique attraction implanted. I find it amazing when I think of the missionaries and the various preachers and those right across the globe tonight, and you think of them, think of the great preachers. Think of the great missionaries. How that some people say even from childhood they can, they can remember having a love for a particular country. 
And then as they come to the Lord, or perhaps they're already Christians, but as they give themselves wholly to the Lord, this, this drawing is toward this particular country. I can think of people who have had drawings toward Africa. I think of people toward Russia. And I can remember thinking, I, how, how did they do that? I couldn't go there. I couldn't do that because God didn't put it in. God has implanted. He made that country. He made it attractive. And there was a drawing toward it. And so in like manner, this man was drawn by the attraction of the fire. It was unique. There was never a burning bush since to draw any man like this. You know, God has a thousand ways to answer every prayer. Never limit the Lord to work in your life the way he has worked in somebody else's. I thank God for those people who have influenced my life. I thank God for the stories of men and women whom God has supernaturally broken in on their lives. I'm, I'm grateful to God, but I, I think I have learned, or I'm certainly learning, that God works uniquely in all our lives. And so God deals with us all in a different way. And it's no problem to him. You see, what happened here was so different to that which happened to other men in the Old Testament. Jacob never saw a burning bush, you know. Jacob lay his head on a stone to fall asleep. And he saw a vision of angels going up and down to heaven. Samuel never saw a burning bush. But Samuel heard a voice. Samuel. Samuel. Isaiah never saw a burning bush, but, but he saw the Lord enthroned in his glory. I say God has so many unique ways of drawing and handling people. And that's why we have to stay open to the Lord as individuals. Because God will never find you or I perhaps in a wilderness or a desert. But he can find you in your home. He can find you on the farm. He can find you in the workplace. He can find you in the office. God knows where you are. And he can create the unique, uh, the unique way of, of speaking to you and communicating to your soul. This burning bush, burning bush brought Moses into close proximity with God. You see, initially, Moses was taking up with a fire. But before long, he was taken up with God. You see, initially, there's a burning bush has captivated him. And then the Bible says, when the Lord saw that he was come near, God called unto him, out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. So the burning bush suddenly became of little importance because now it was the voice of God. There's a lesson for you and I in that God works in the realm of the supernatural, but we must not be obsessed or taken up with unique and unusual ways of God. We need to be taken up not with the method that God uses, but with the, the God who ultimately speaks himself with God. You see, this man was moved from the realm of power to the presence of the Lord. And that was a progressive movement in the life of Moses, the man who saw wonderful miracles, the man who, who, who was to be given unusual powers by the Lord to communicate to Israel that he was God's chosen, the man who was to witness the plagues, the man who was to witness the opening of the Dead Sea. Perhaps no other man in history ever saw such great miracles as Moses. And yet you find at the latter stages of his life, Moses is crying, show me thy glory. At the end of his life, you find this old man being called by the Lord. No protests, not, nothing stated that we're aware of, but just going up alone as an old man to Mount Nebo so that God will take him to heaven and then God will bury his mortal frame. The man became obsessed with God. 
he could have made a fortune telling stories about things God had done. But he just became obsessed with God. Close proximity to God. This burning bush experience was a sanctifying experience. You see, when this bush was drawn or drew the attention of Moses and he went over to it, the Lord spoke and Moses said, Here am I. And the next statement was, Draw not nigh hither. Don't come any closer. Put off thy shoes, which speaks of contamination with the world. Put off thy shoes from off thy place, for the place whereon thou standest, that is the ground you're on at the moment. Don't come any closer. The ground you're on at the moment is already sanctified ground. You're on holy ground. You see, the presence of God was in the bush. And we find that in Acts chapter 7 when Stephen is relating the story of, of Israel. That he said that it was God who was in the bush. And God's presence sanctified the ground. It wasn't sanctified by anything other than God's presence. You know, there's a great danger in us getting into an ABC method of being sanctified. Sanctification is a work wherein God takes possession. God takes control of all the ground. That is sanctification. The very God of peace sanctify you holy. God, God's presence. It was a sanctifying power. It was a life transforming experience, which of course it would have been. You see, whenever this man was brought in touch, not so much with the bush, nor with the fact that it hadn't consumed, but with the fact that it was God, this man immediately takes off his shoes. He's not fully aware of all that's happening. The Lord starts to speak to him. And when he does, this man commences to bring his objections to the Lord as to why the Lord should pass him by. I'm convinced that this is so necessary for the Lord to have absolute control of the vessel. When you and I honestly, honestly, before God and men, recognize that we really can do nothing, that outside of God we are hopeless, helpless, useless, and that unless God is empowering us, and God is guiding us, and God is using us, our lives are totally and utterly ineffective. It was a transforming experience. You see, this man was no longer attempting to rescue the Jews. <laughs> this man said, Lord, please, not me. God had done a good work in the 40 years. He had stripped him of all his own power. And that's a painful and a very necessary experience in the life of every Christian, that stripping, until God gets us to that place, and only he knows it, when we are prepared for usefulness or more usefulness in his kingdom. Finally, it produced certainty. This man prior to the burning bush, there was an uncertainty about what it was all about. There was an inner compulsion and awareness that God had called him, but an uncertainty about the future. It was like he, he had been prepared, but he didn't know what for. The burning bush transformed 
all of that. And in a few moments of time, after 40 years of silence, God communicated deeply into his spirit the purpose for which he would live the remainder of his life and what God had made him for. And God told him that he was going to be the leader of a people. He was going to take them into the land that he had promised Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. It produced certainty. And you find this man, Moses, after 40 long years, immediately he lays aside the sheep. Immediately he communicates with his wife and children. Immediately all the folk that he has known for 40 years, you can imagine all the folk he knows, suddenly the word gets out, Moses is going. What's wrong with Moses? He was fine this morning. He was just like one of us this morning. What's happened? He met God. He met God. You can't produce this. It was said of Evan Roberts. Evan Roberts was greatly prepared by the Lord for the awakening. But it says of Evan Roberts prior to the awakening when God ultimately came upon him that he was waking up in the night and praying for hours. God was enabling him and calling him specifically to do these things. We should never attempt these things in our own strength. But God was doing that in this young man that he was preparing. But they said of Evan Roberts that whenever ultimately the revival was coming, God had a tremendous meeting with him. And they said everything about Evan Roberts was different. Everything. What was the explanation? Was it that Evan Roberts tried to put on this supernatural spiritual cover that he said, I'll get everybody to recognize? Not at all. Evan Roberts met God. Evan Roberts was transformed from the inside out. Evan Roberts had such a meeting with God that he was totally absorbed in what God had called him to and he no longer had time for the things that he used to have time for. He no longer had interest in the conversations that he had interested in. They were legitimate, they were fine. He didn't have time now because God had come to him. There was a certainty in the life of Moses. He said goodbye to all. And he went on that great journey that would lead him to deliver the people under God and ultimately to go to heaven and to have a song written that they call the Song of Moses and the Lamb. Let me conclude with a verse, though. It's a paraphrase of a verse Isaiah 30 and verse 1. Just listen. Because you know it's so important that we grasp there, there'll never be another Moses. There'll never be another Moses. But if God has called you into his kingdom, God has a work for you. There are no trivial callings with God. No trivial callings. God has a calling on your life. He wants to perform it through you. But listen to what it says in paraphrase form. You make plans, the Lord says, that are contrary to my will. You weave a web of plans that are not from my spirit. Thus piling up your sin. For without consulting me, you have gone down to Egypt to find help. You know, in the church and in our lives as individuals, we can be making plans that are contrary to God's plans. And we can be weaving webs. You know what a web's for? Security. We can be making everything secure. We're trying to get everything sussed out, everything secure. We weaving our web. <coughs> Plans that are not from the Holy Spirit. You know, God wants you and I to be submissive to him so that the Holy Spirit is giving us the proper plan. You say, well, what's the seriousness of really, 
you know, being a good evangelical and waving your own plans. What's the problem with that? And not relying on the Holy Spirit to give us our plans. What's, what's the seriousness of that? I never really felt to any great degree or understood the seriousness of that until I read this. The Lord said, thus piling up your own sins. It's sin. To web your own plan and not get your calling and get your plans from the Holy Spirit is piling up sin. You see, God is jealous over each of us that our lives would be totally open to him. Brothers and sisters, I pray that God will take these simple truths that were applicable in the life of Moses and that he will make them real in your life and mine as we seek under God to do what God has saved us for and to find that plan or rather to continue in that plan and meet with the God of the supernatural. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father, we thank thee again for thy word. We thank thee for the help of thy Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, that you have a work for each one of us. And we bless thee, Lord, that though our land is dark, and though there are many things causing despair, yet we rejoice, thou art the Lord God of Moses. And, Father, you never fail. You're on your throne, and you're as great and grand and powerful as you ever have been. Nothing you have done down the ages have ever diminished your power. You're the Lord God Almighty, and you reign omnipotently, and we bless thee, and we worship and adore thee. And, O oh God, you would we pray in Jesus' name that, Lord, you would be merciful to each one of us. Help us to get our plans from thee, and help each one of us, O oh God, to ever be meeting the God of the supernatural and to be carried along under him with our hands securely in Jesus' hands and the Holy Spirit guiding us step by step. Hear us, we pray. Receive our thanks for all your mercies. In Jesus' name, amen.